Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Equality California's latest Power Hour. Um, we have a great conversation and a great panel lined up for you tonight. Um, tonight, we'll be talking about what the LGBTQ plus community needs to know about the COVID-19 vaccine. So it's been about a year since California entered a state of emergency to combat COVID-19, and research shows that the ongoing global pandemic has really had a devastating impact on the LGBTQ plus community, especially LGBTQ plus people of color. And in February of this year, a study by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, confirmed that underlying health disparities faced by LGBTQ plus people leave the community particularly vulnerable to the virus. And at Equality California, part of our mission is to help every LGBTQ plus Californian who is impacted by COVID-19. And to that end, we launched a statewide bilingual campaign promoting COVID-19 vaccination, testing, and safety guidance. And that campaign includes direct outreach to LGBTQ plus Californians, as well as engagement through virtual town hall events, social media, coordination with our community-based partners, and our online COVID-19 help center, um, which you should all feel free to call if you need assistance. And I believe we have some information on the screen for you there. Um, audience members should know that you can receive direct support um, in finding available vaccination and testing sites via that helpline. And there are other resources on our website there. And since April of 2020, we have been hosting installments of our ongoing Power Hour series. So tonight, as I said, we will be discussing what LGBTQ plus people should know about the COVID-19 vaccine. You may have seen some breaking news today, which is that starting April 1st in California, um, people who are age 50 and over will be eligible. And starting April 15th, people 16 and older will be eligible. So that's a great development so, and makes this conversation particularly timely. Um, and for the audience, we're about to get started. So please feel free to enter your questions into the chat box and we will cover as many as we can. But I wanna give our panelists a chance to introduce themselves. Um, so Dr. Eisenberg, would you like to kick us off? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Barry Eisenberg. I'm an internist and I uh, practice at Sutter Health in uh, the Palo Alto Medical Foundation in Palo Alto. I self-identify as a cisgendered gay man, and the majority of my practice is aimed at uh, gay men's health, but I also run our comprehensive gender care program uh, that has been developed over the last several years. Uh, one of my other interests is addressing health disparities, and I chair a committee called the Cultural Competence Committee. And then finally, I'd just like to say, um, you know, just as a physician, um, at its most basic level, my, I view my role as partnering with my patients to help them lead the lives that they choose to lead healthfully and without judgment. And that is what grounds me every day in the work that I do. Okay. Great. Uh, good evening. My name is Amanda McAllister Walner. I use she, her, hers pronouns. I'm the director of the California LGBTQ Health and Human Services Network. We're a statewide organization focused on advocating for policies and systems change that will advance LGBTQ health equity throughout the state. Um, and we work with our partners um, in all uh, 58 counties to do um, LGBTQ uh, health education, uh, training, and um, uh, <laughs> advocacy um, to advance health at the local and state levels. Um, we were really happy last year to partner with Equality California and Senator Wiener's office um, to ensure that the state collects sexual orientation and gender identity data regarding COVID-19. And there is definitely still a lot of work to do on that front. Um, I also serve on California's Community Vaccine Advisory Committee um, elevating the important issues of ensuring that LGBTQ people have access to the COVID-19 vaccine and that our communities, um, you know, are, are able to, to see it through to the light at the end of this tunnel um, and, and get out of this pandemic um, thanks to the vaccine. All right, uh, good, uh, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Jorge Roman. Um, use uh, he, him pronouns. Um, I am a nurse practitioner and I'm the clinic director at Magnet for the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. 
Um, Magnet Clinic is uh, located in the Castro, which is the heart of the LGBTQ community in San Francisco. Uh, we offer STI screening and treatment. Um, in addition to HIV prevention, uh, where we've got one of the largest prep programs in the country, uh, we offer screening and treatment um, and provide linkage to care services for um, individuals living with HIV who have found themselves out of care. Um, and in addition to that, we um, offer Hep C services. Um, in general, I would say Magnet um, is uh, really welcoming to everyone in the community um, and looking to expand uh, our care to, to all segments of uh, the San Francisco LGBTQ community. Thank you for welcoming me to this. Great, yeah, thank you so much for joining. This information is gonna be really important and really timely for people. So um, we'll get into a few questions. And again, if you're just joining, uh, please feel free to enter questions for our panelists in the chat box and we will cover as many as we can. Uh, so California recently expanded vaccine eligibility, specifically to those with significant high risk medical conditions, disabilities, illness, living spaces, or work environments that put them at a higher risk for serious COVID-19 illness. So my question for the panelists, uh, to help everyone understand, what do these eligibility guidelines mean and how do we all know if we are eligible? Well, I guess I, I can start. Um, so, uh, well, first of all, um, you know, as you just um, mentioned, Tammy, uh, the guidelines are going to be significantly broadened very, very soon. So that is wonderful news for everyone involved. I know it's been really frustrating for people uh, to open this up in, in tears. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's been confusing for people to navigate that. And um, uh, I hear that every day in, in my work. But um, there was a, a, a reason for that. And that's tried to try to get the people who are most at risk, either because of their age or their underlying uh, conditions or their exposure because of their work um, situation, uh, the, the vaccine first. And that actually helps everyone because those are the people more most at risk and uh, therefore most at risk of spreading it. So if you get those people first, um, that's gonna uh, help everyone. Um, but the, 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 the underlying conditions, you know, right now as they stand um, have to do with chronic conditions for the most part that have been found to have increased uh, adverse effects if the person were to develop COVID. Um, so I'll leave it at that rather than going into some of the details unless there are specific questions about that and, and hand it over to my colleagues here. Yeah, you know, I, I just will piggyback on Dr. Eisenberg's comments. Uh, you know, I think the really great news is that recently uh, we've found out that, you know, and reassure everyone that, um, you know, very quickly and very soon, everyone is going to be eligible. So we're just about to expand those eligibility requirements um, as of April 1st um, for 50 and over, as Tammy mentioned, um, and then April 15th, 16 and over. So that's really great news. Um, and as Dr. Eisenberg, you know, stated right, right now, really what we're emphasizing um, is chronic health conditions. And, you know, it really does um, depend a lot by municipality. So I know that different counties are, are doing different things. And so the important thing is really getting, um, you know, uh, uh, informed about what's going on in your own county. You know, specifically in San Francisco, we've expanded those eligibility requirements to include people um, living with HIV, for example, which was not included in the chronic health conditions uh, for California specifically, um, people experiencing homelessness are, uh, and disability. So um, again, really good to hear that, you know, starting April 1st, we'll be expanding that. Yeah, I just want to say, you know, California has done a great job um, over the past few months of getting our cases down, getting our hospitalizations down, um, and really reducing the number of deaths due to COVID-19 over these last few months since the peak um, in December and January. And a big part of that does mean um, getting vaccinated when it's our turn. Um, we know that this virus, um, you know, it has, has uh, ravaged, um, you know, Americans and, and Californians, um, and it hasn't hit all of our communities equally. Um, not only LGBTQ people, but people who uh, have jobs on the front lines um, in service industries, 
um, and essential services, um, communities of color, um, and people with underlying health conditions, which are overrepresented in a particularly Black and Latinx communities, um, have been really heavily impacted by this. And that's why it's so important to make sure that our uh, vaccine implementation and that we're getting it out there to the people who need it most. Um, our response has to be um, equitable because this vaccine has been, or this this virus has been incredibly unequitable. Um, it's 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 hurt a lot of our disadvantaged communities uh, the most. And um, you know, I think if you're if you're like me, if you're someone who hasn't you know isn't currently prioritized to get a vaccine, and you're kind of sitting around anxiously, you know, wondering what do I do? You know, uh, you know, what do, am I just, am I just waiting until, um, you know, until April, until, uh, you know, the middle of the month when it, when it is my turn? Um, you know, I think there are a number of ways that we can make sure that in the meantime, while we're waiting, we're keeping our communities safe. Um, you know, continuing to wear that mask, your masks um, and and you know the newer guide guidance is saying double mask um, is is the most effective way to prevent the spread. Um, keeping your physical distance from folks um, six feet apart, um, and uh, and help your help your neighbors, help your family members who are eligible right now um, get vaccinated. Uh, you know I was very humbled by having to go through this process myself to get my to help my grandparents sign up to get the vaccine. Um, and uh, and I know that um, for for folks who uh, you know maybe haven't had to navigate some of these uh, online systems before, it can be really intimidating and tricky. Um, and so I really encourage those of you who are waiting for your turn right now, um, keep doing what you can to protect your communities by, you know, by wearing that mask and by keeping your distance. And also, you know, knock on your neighbor's door, um, you know, wearing a mask, standing back <laughs> um, and see, you know, have they been able to get, get an appointment for a vaccine? You know, check in with your grandparents or um, your loved ones uh, or your friends who are eligible and, and make sure that, um, you know, that, that they've been able to sign up. Because I think as um, Barry and Jorge mentioned, you know, we're all safer when those of us who are eligible are getting vaccinated. And I would also just like to tag on to um, what Amanda and Jorge said. And uh, the LGBTQ uh, population actually has a lot of the chronic, has an increased um, uh, incidence of some of the chronic conditions uh, that um, people are allowed to get vaccines. So obviously HIV, but also, um, you know, there are some jurisdictions that allow people who smoke. So smoking is is a higher incidence in the in this in our community. Um, cancer, obesity. So there are a lot of conditions that affect our community uh, for which um, we need to get um, our community vaccinated. So now that we know that vaccine eligibility will be greatly expanded in just a few weeks here in California, what are the different types? of COVID vaccines currently available. I'm sure people are getting a lot of different information on that front as well. What are the differences between them? And do we need to choose which one we get? Do we even get to choose which vaccine we get? Um, so, and then I have a follow-up question after that too. Sure, I, I mean, I could start this one off. I, you know, I think the first thing I wanna stress is that all three of the vaccines that are currently available um, for and have been uh, approved by for emergency use in the country right now have been found to be 100% effective at preventing complications, uh, severe disease, hospitalizations, and deaths related to COVID-19. Um, so all three vaccine options are very effective at preventing the most serious impacts of COVID-19. I think that's the message really want to get across to everyone. Um, you know the the uh, First two vaccines that were initially um, rolled out, the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines, those are two doses. Uh, the Moderna vaccine separated by four weeks, the Pfizer vaccine separated by three weeks. And we have the newest addition to uh, the mix here, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Uh, that one's only one dose. Um, and so what's great is that the more options that there are, the more vaccinations there are, uh, the, the more spread we have of the vaccination out there for our community. Um, and what I would say, my, my 
my recommendation to folks is don't shop around. If uh, the vac whatever vaccine comes to your community, take it. Um, if it's the Moderna vaccine, grab the Moderna vaccine. Don't wait for the Pfizer um, or the Johnson & Johnson. Um, I know that that you know, uh, m might be uh, folks' um, maybe inclination at first, but really what we wanna do is make sure that people get the vaccine as quickly as they can. Um, and so what comes to you, I say snap, snap it up. So um, get vaccinated. Um, so I, I would also uh, like to, also like to say that these vaccines are a triumph of medical science. And, you know, I just personally feel incredibly fortunate to be alive right now that uh, the science has uh, advanced to the point where these vaccines have become available. And um, I really, really want to emphasize that. I think we're incredibly lucky to be alive um, to benefit from this. And the only, the only other point I wanna make is that um, the only vaccine that is uh, uh, available for the 16 to 18 age range um, is the Pfizer vaccine. So the, other, the others have not been approved for that age. Yeah, just want to underscore what what Jorge said. Um, you know, the the vaccine that's that um, I would encourage you to get is the one you can get. Um, the one that's being offered, the one that you can get an appointment for. Um, that's you know that's that's the uh, the right one. And I think you know what what Barry shared as well. All of these vaccines have gone through. Um, rigorous clinical trials. Um, you know, I think there were a, was a lot of concern early on, um, and a lot of misinformation early on that corners were cut or that you know this was, um, and it truly was unprecedented. Um, the the um, the advances that we saw in vaccine research and development uh, for COVID nineteen, um, but all of these have been um, you know thoroughly tested and vetted and. Um, are, are safe and effective at present, preventing um, serious illness and, and death due to COVID-19. And so a couple of you have mentioned efficacy. So I just wanna expand on that a little bit um, with our first audience question. So thank you for submitting this. What are the differences in efficacy, if any, between the three vaccines that are available here in the US, both overall and against any emerging variants? Um. I can take that. So um, I think that it's probably, you know, okay to lump Moderna and Pfizer together uh, in terms of efficacy. Um, so uh, the data shows that those vaccines are 94 to 95% effective in preventing disease. And as Jorge said earlier, 100% effective in preventing serious disease, hospitalization, and death. Um, the J and J. Um, uh, efficacy is lower. It was 66%. But again, you can't um, you can't compare those two efficacy rates because they were done on different populations at different times during the pandemic when maybe more variants were available. So you really, it's like you know comparing apples and oranges. You can't compare them. But the important thing is that um, they uh, all of them prevent the serious complications of COVID. So, yeah, so it sounds like the bottom line is still just get whichever one you can get. <laughs> um, and that, that seems to be a common thread. So for, for anyone who, who might be hesitating, um, you know, given that LGBTQ plus people, especially people who are Black, Latinx, or low income, also have to contend with other existing health disparities, uh, why is it important for our, our vulnerable communities to get vaccinated now? We want to party with you at Pride in 2022. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think I think uh, we're the the sooner we can make sure that our communities get vaccinated, the sooner we can um, be together again. Um, we're starting to get some really great new guidance from CDC. Um, you know, if you have multiple people who've been vaccinated, um, being able to to um, you know see one another again. Um, it's, uh, you know, I think it's really, um, we're, there's a, there's a light at the end of this tunnel. Um, and I think after the, the year that we've had, um, of, uh, losing too many people, um, of, you know, the, the mental health crisis that has accompanied, um, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we want to make sure that, 
um, that everyone in our community is is there with us at the finish line, um, is there, uh, you know, celebrating with us at Pride um, and getting vaccinated is one of the biggest steps that you can take right now um, to make sure that that um, you're protected and that you're able to to return to um, some of those things that really bring our life so much joy and color and sparkle. <laughs> And you know, there, there's another point I wanted to make on this, and that there has been a, a study done that looked at you know why LGBTQ people get vaccinated, and one of the results of that study was that 75% uh, uh, of people respond, as compared to 48% of non-LGBTQ people, responded that they're doing it for the public good, and that's pretty remarkable. Um, and amazing. And so that's another reason to get vaccinated, not just for yourself, but for all of us. Um, because the more people who are immunized, you know, the sooner we're going to reach herd immunity and, and beat this thing. Yeah, you know, this, I, I would say this is really important question. Um, you know, what we know is that communities of color are disproportionately represented as essential workers. Um, and we also know more specifically that the rate of death related to complications of COVID-19 are highest among Latinx individuals um, and uptake and access to the vaccines um, in, the com in these communities is lowest. And I just, I just find that, you know, unacceptable really. Um, it's, it's of paramount importance that we eliminate the health disparities um, experienced by LGBTQ plus communities, um, especially those intersecting with our immigrant communities, black, indigenous, and all communities of color. Uh, we really must end the discrimination and stop the marginalization of queer and black and brown people. And so to do that, we must work across sectors to address the implications of structural racism and economic inequality and to mitigate the effects of stigma uh, felt by people living with HIV, particularly among people of color. Um, it should not take another global pandemic for health professionals like ourselves to understand that this is the work. Um, in the end, health justice is racial justice. Definitely. Uh, for those who may have just joined tonight, we are discussing what LGBTQ plus people should know about the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, Equality California has been using every available avenue to conduct outreach about the vaccine as well as other resources um, since the start of the pandemic. And audience members should know that you can receive direct support with finding vaccination and testing sites via our helpline. And we also have an online COVID-19 help center. So you can see that information there on your screen. And during tonight's event, um, please submit your questions through the chat box. We have um, amazing panelists with us, to, with us tonight and such great expertise. And we wanna um, make the best use of our time with them. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, and, you know, once we are notified that it is our turn for the vaccine, that, that long-awaited moment uh, through myturn.ca.gov, what should people prepare and what should they expect? So do they need to stock up on soup and electrolytes for any side effects? What else do they need to know? What if they've already had COVID-19? Do they still even need to get the vaccine? Um, so I think people would benefit from hearing those points too. Yeah. I can start um, and then I'm sure I'm sure you'll have things to add. Um, a couple of things. I think once you're notified that it's your turn, um, you know, make sure that that you have the information you need to sign up. Um, for the most part, uh, the only thing that you'll really need to show is proof that you live in California. Um, and uh, if your eligibility is based on your age, proof of your age. Um, you know, for, for certain other types of eligibility, um, for instance, my wife is a teacher, she had to show her, you know, her school district, um, uh, you know, it, employment verification. Um, but for most of us, uh, or, you know, for those of us who are, are eligible based on our age, that's usually simple enough. Um, the other thing to know, too, is that uh, the vaccine is free. Um, so, uh, you're, you may be asked for information about your health plan or your health care coverage. Um, that is, uh, you know, for informational purposes, for follow-up care purposes, um, but the vaccine is free and, um, you know, whether you have insurance or not, um, you should not have to pay a penny 
um, to get vaccinated because you're helping all of us by getting vaccinated, um, you know, and and uh, and and so I do want to make sure that that's clear. I know I helped someone enroll recently or sign up for an appointment recently, and they were like, "Why are they asking me for my insurance information? You know, am I going to have to pay out of pocket?" So I want to make sure that folks know that. Um, in terms of the you know the uh, question about if I've already had COVID nineteen, should I still get vaccinated? Yes. <laughs> Um, you know, yes, absolutely. That's an easy one word answer. Um, even if you've had COVID-19 before, um, you are still encouraged to get vaccinated when you're eligible. Um, you may feel like someone punched you in the arm for a couple of days. Um, you may feel uh, like, um, you know, like you have the flu or, or a cold for a couple of days. That's your immune system working. <laughs> um, that's your immune system uh, learning how to fight COVID-19. Um, and so, you know, take that as a, a um, you know, take that as a good sign that the vaccine is working and that your body's doing its job. Um, you know, I, I definitely would encourage folks if you have the ability to, um, uh, you know, to take the day off of work the day afterward, um, you know, to be on the safe side. I, I think it doesn't hurt, <laughs> um, but it really varies from person to person what those side effects will be like. So, you know, encourage you to, to do what, to prepare you the way you would for, you know, if you were gonna get a, a, a cold or, or the flu, you know, if you wanna have those electrolytes or something ready. Yeah, and I'll just piggyback on what Amanda said. So yeah, as far as um, uh, kind of side effects, what I tell my clients and patients is, uh, you know, it really does vary uh, from person to person. So I would gar I'm would i going to guarantee that you're going to feel a sore arm for sure, um, that at least for 24 hours. Um, but then everything else really does vary. So it's like those cold malaise kind of symptoms, maybe a fever, maybe some chills, maybe some body aches, maybe a headache, maybe a little nausea. Some people either get all of those symptoms very mildly or one of those symptoms really intensely. Um, and so I would say, you know, for the most part, I think, um, as Amanda mentioned, it's like your immune system really getting ready, um, kind of building itself up to really um, uh, fight COVID if you your body ever finds it. And so that's really the important thing. Um, and in the end, it's really worth it, right? So, um, a, you know, a little ache here um, for maybe 24, 48 hours um, in the grand scheme of things is, um, I think, well worth it, um, considering what we're doing is is ensuring the health of our communities, um, health of our family members, uh, you know, ability to, you know, get the economy reopened and being able to hang out, like Amanda said, for LGBT pride, you know, um, that's really the important things like that, getting back to some semblance of normalcy. So, um, so yeah, take a little Tylenol, maybe some electrolytes um, and you'll get through it for sure. Um, and, I, and I would add, um, you know, if you're on chronic medications, um, continue to take them. Don't stop your HIV meds. Um, it's okay. Um, I, uh, Jorge just mentioned take Tylenol or ibuprofen. That's fine to do it afterwards. Um, there is some guidance probably not to pre-medicate yourself with, with those types of drugs. Um, although there, you know, it's, we don't really know, but, um, if you were to, if I were to, advise my patients, I'd say don't take Tylenol or ibuprofen beforehand, okay to take it afterward. Um, and then also the other thing that comes up sometimes is um, you can't get the vaccine if you've had another vaccine within two weeks. So if you, um, you know, just had a shingles vaccine or a tetanus vaccine or hepatitis B vaccine or something like that, you really need to wait two weeks before you get a COVID vaccine. So that goes into your planning. Okay, that's that's really helpful. And we've got a few questions about waiting periods and things like that. So I'm hearing, you know, if you already have had COVID-19, yes, still get the vaccine. One question that we got from the audience is, is there a waiting period, though, between when you contracted it and when you can get vaccinated? Do we know that? Um, so it's recommended, one, that you have resolved your symptoms of COVID before you get vaccinated. Um, uh, and uh, so, and usually you want to do want to get the vaccine within 90 days of the infection. And also, if um, if you did receive um, treatment for COVID with um, monoclonal antibodies or or plasma, you also um, you probably want to wait uh, around 90 days. Okay, perfect. Um, 
And, you know, Amanda, in terms of prerequisites for what you need to take with you to your vaccine, I heard you say you just need to show you live in California. Do we know if that's any different for undocumented folks? Will they need to take anything else? Um, we got that question from the audience as well. Yeah, undocumented folks are eligible to get the vaccine in California. Um, my, uh, I think, you know, it's a good idea to check with your vaccination site about what they will expect you to bring um, in terms of um, proof of eligibility. Um, but, uh, but you know, you, you do not need to be documented um, in order to get the vaccine. Okay. Um, we got another audience question. I think I know the answer to this, but I'm just going to pose it again to really drive it home. Which vaccine is the best one to get? The one that's being offered to you is what I would say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. That, that seems to be the consensus. Um, so uh, to expand on, on some of these waiting periods, if someone ha is, has received the first vaccine, but for some reason they were unable to get the second one, um, what should they do? And how long can someone realistically wait between those doses? Or do you have to start over all again if, if too much time has passed? Um, so the recommend, you know, the recommended intervals for Pfizer is three weeks, Moderna is four weeks. Um, uh, the CDC has said that it's okay to go up to six weeks. So that's your, you know, that's the preferred interval. Um, and so uh, you should really try to do it in that time frame. We don't know, you know, what uh, it's it is like after six weeks. It probably would be helpful, but we don't know. So my recommendation is really to try to get it in within six weeks. I, I would just add that the recommendation right now is if you don't get it within that time frame, that you don't need to start over the series. Um, and so right now, at least, um, it's still two um, doses for the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine, and of course, one for uh, the Johnson and Johnson. Okay, perfect. Um, all right. So, you know, Dr. Eisenberg, you mentioned a caution about if you've received other types of vaccines, the recommendation is um, a waiting period before the COVID-19 vaccine. Does that also apply to the Depo Provera vaccine? Um, the, well, Depo Provera is not really a vaccine. Um, so I don't I, I would think it doesn't matter. I don't. I don't. I haven't read anything about that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if any of my, if Jorge or Amanda know anything about that. Yeah, depots um, uh, contraception, and so wouldn't worry in that case. Um, any that there shouldn't be any um, contraindications um, or mixing with Depo-Provera and um, either of any of the uh, vaccines, to my knowledge. Our audience is keeping us on our toes tonight. Um, all right, so we got another comment slash question from the family, from the audience. It sounds like um, someone's family has been vaccinated, which is great. Congratulations. Um, of course, everyone's eager to see each other again in person. So what are those recommendations now? I know they're changing all the time for in-person interactions, um, even if people have been vaccinated. So the current um, the the current guidance on uh, on mingling um, post uh, post vaccination is um, you know if you're in a group or a crowd um, to still wear a mask and maintain six feet of distance um, you know there if you're uh, you know going for a hike going for something outside. Um, you know, that is uh, a little bit safer and um, but still encouraged to wear a mask um, if, uh, you know, if you're going to be around people that you don't know whether or not they're also vaccinated. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, um, if you've been vaccinated and the person that you're visiting has also been vaccinated, um, they uh, the CDC did release guidance on that. Um, I think it was a, a week or maybe two weeks ago now, um, and said that that uh, they that they do believe that is safe. 
Um, so uh, if you've been vaccinated, the person you're visiting has also been vaccinated from another household. Um, you can uh, um, visit mask-free safely. Um, and that is, uh, um, you know, whoever thought that that would be such a big deal, right? To be able to go over to someone's house, sit inside, have a cup of tea together or, you know, um, whatever, and, and not have to wear a mask. Um, as more and more people are vaccinated, I expect we'll see, you know, continued expansion on these guidelines. Um, but that is what we know so far. Perfect. Um, all right. So my next question is, you know, we live in a virtual age where it seems like someone can say something online and it takes on a life of its own. And so there's a lot of disinformation and misinformation about the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and, you know, we've heard tonight about the efficacy of the vaccine, the safety of the vaccine. Um, but what else can healthcare professionals do to help ease the fears of those who might still be unsure about the vaccine, especially marginalized communities who um, don't have the best experiences or haven't had historically the best experiences when it comes to seeking medical care in general? Um, and how can we encourage our loved ones and relieve their fears? Um, I think that, you know, whenever uh, someone or a group of people express hesitancy about a medical intervention, you need to take that seriously and understand where that's coming from. And um, particularly with uh, the LGBTQ community, uh, we have a lot of experience um, of a bad experience with the medical profession. Um, you know, the HIV epidemic was, uh, you know, not taken seriously initially. Um, certainly for transgender individuals, 90% have had uh, experience discrimination from the medical profession. Um, and so it's no wonder why our community may be somewhat hesitant and, and uh, there may be misinformation and disinformation. And I think um, what it comes down to is, is building relationships and trust. And um, I think that's what we're trying to do uh, tonight and, and trying to get the information to people in a way uh, that they hear it. Um, and that uh, answers the questions and concerns that they have. Yeah, I mean, I just wanna say, you know, thank you to Equality California for hosting this conversation. I think it's kind of, you know, continues a long line um, and a, a long history of LGBTQ folks um, really coming together in times of need and um, advocating for our, our own health and our own community's health, educating each other and filling in the gaps um, when there is that mistrust in with the um, you know with with uh, systems, government systems, healthcare systems, um, and yeah, I'm, I'm uh, echo what what Dr. Eisenberg said. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to answer some of these questions because there are very valid reasons why our communities um, have that mistrust, um, and I want to make sure that that folks have accurate information. Um, so that our communities can be safe, healthy, and take advantage of the vaccines that are out there. Yeah, you know, I just I just want to add that you know we're coming from an era also where disinformation and misinformation have been weaponized in ways that we just have not experienced before. And so I think I really acknowledge and understand people's concerns and fears about the vaccine rollout and the virus in general. And so I think it's really contingent upon us who are in the workforce um, to understand why communities of, of color might be mistrustful about the, our institutions, right? Um, there's a history base there of unethical medical and public health um, practices, uh, particularly amongst communities of color, uh, decreased access to medical and public health services, and ongoing discrimination and inequities in medical care uh, being delivered. And so I think it's really on us um, as healthcare providers to get the message out, to really support and, and talk with confidence to our clients about what really is true, what is the correct information, that these vaccines are safe, that the recommendations that our public health experts have put out is accurate and correct. Um, and the way to uh, make sure our communities are safe um, that we're able to reopen the economy and 
um, able to take steps to get back to some level of normalcy um, is for people to take steps like getting the vaccine. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's things like um, making sure that you're um, uh, eliminating some of the barriers for people to access the vaccine, like language, for example, making sure that um, people can get the information um, that's appropriate for them based on language, uh, making sure that immigration is not a factor in accessing any care, whether it's the vaccine or otherwise, um, you know, knocking down barriers like insurance status, um, and then prioritizing and centering, specifically centering um, black, indigenous, trans, queer, and all communities of color um, when you're focusing any efforts um, to uh, make sure to mitigate these impacts. Super, super important. Um, for anyone who may have just joined, of course, tonight we are discussing what LGBTQ plus people should know about the COVID-19 vaccine. We're getting tons of great information from our panelists. I really encourage you to put your questions in the chat box. Um, we're approaching the end of the hour, so we will get to as many as we can. Um, and we have received some additional questions. One is, is there an appointment hotline? So I believe we're gonna put some information up for the audience um, about where they can call. So the California COVID-19 hotline, if you're not able to see the screen, it's 1-833-422-4255. Um, they're open pretty normal hours during the week as well as hours on the weekend. So give that a try. Um, you can also use um, myturn.ca.gov as a resource to find out when you are eligible. Um, so we encourage you to look there as well. Um, another audience question, uh, which I'm curious about as well, do we think that vaccination will be a yearly or recurring process in some way? Is this gonna be something that we need to do every so often or how long is the vaccine good for? I think that's TBD. Yeah. <laughs> you don't know. Yeah. Yeah. They're, I know they're currently, you know, they're currently studying um, what boosters will be needed or, you know, if boosters will be needed um, and also looking at, you know, uh, how do we ensure effectiveness against the different variants that, um, that we're seeing because uh, this dang virus keeps uh, mutating. Um, <laughs> and so we want to make sure that, um, uh, you know, that, that folks are safe and, and yeah, scientists are, are as eager to find the answer to that question as we are um, and, and are, are working on it now. Yep. But one thing we know, and that's get whichever vaccine is offered to you. <laughs> <laughs> They're all great. Um, all right. So, you know, we, we're all working together. We're doing everything we can to keep our communities in California healthy. Um, for medical frontline workers in particular, what can folks do right now to help them during this time? Yeah, I'll take this as a frontline worker myself. Um, so, you know, the first thing is get vaccinated. As you know, it's been the topic of what we've been discussing for. Um, again, thank you, Equality California, for having this really important forum. I think the point is let's get vaccinated, get everyone vaccinated as soon as you can and you're eligible, please do so. Um, continue social distancing. It's really important that people do maintain those recommendations, wearing masks when out in public and around people who haven't been completely vaccinated uh, vaccinated, and, and washing hands and maintaining that le level of hygiene. Um, and, you know, something that Amanda mentioned at the beginning, which I'd like to kind of circle back around to, um, and that's helping others. Um, you know, there are a lot of people, and I assure you there are people in your community right now who just can't navigate what sometimes is very complicated systems. Um, you know, no shade for grandma and grandpa, but they may not necessarily be tech savvy um, and may not be able to, uh, may not have a computer, may not know how to use the internet. And so this is your time to kind of step up and, and help people in your community who need um, help in accessing really important health information, but more importantly, to get an appointment for a vaccination. Yeah, I think, I, Jorge, I think that's it, exactly, you know, I just want to echo everything you just said. Um, uh, you know, continuing to do our part to reduce the spread of the virus, um, 
you know, let people have a, let our, let our frontline essential health workers have a day off maybe, um, you know, in the, in the next few months, I know my friends, um, and, uh, and family who are, are in the medical field, um, are pretty tired. And so, so that's, you know, a big part of what we can do. Mm -hmm. Um, there are also volunteer opportunities, um, for, uh, non-medical, um, professionals to help with vaccine dissemination too. So if you've already made sure that your grandparents are vaccinated, that your, you know, your loved ones and friends who are eligible are vaccinated, that your neighbors, um, you know, have, have gotten their appointment. Um, the other thing that you can do is, is also through the state's COVID-19 website, um, and most likely through your county public health website as well. Uh, you can volunteer to help with intake, um, to help with vaccine navigation, um, you know, to to do those things that uh, they just need. They they need um, able bodies to help with. You don't have to have a medical license to do it, um, and it's a you know it's a way that we can help make sure that we're um, you know getting those uh, those vaccines um, you know out into our communities as quickly as possible and and building up our immunity. Um, yeah. And um, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll just add one other thought, um, and that is, um, you know, it is also important to not um, delay your regular preventive care. So uh, keeping up with your health in other ways is also important during this time. And it's also it also brings to light, you know, the issue is if you haven't been able to find someone you can connect with as a health provider, um, you know, think about ways of, of doing that. It's really important you know, to have that kind of relationship and build that trust so you can get the information you need to keep yourself healthy. And there are, you know, certainly uh, sites out there that can connect you with LGBT uh, friendly doctors uh, throughout the state of California. And we got an audience question that um, may not come up as, you know, a, a first thought for a lot of people when you think about a health crisis, but that's about employee <laughs> rights. And so if someone is denied paid sick leave after contracting COVID, or if they're temporarily ill following a vaccine and need to care for themselves, do we know what their rights are right now or any resources or organizations we can point the audience to? Um, I see we've got saferatwork.covid19.ca.gov up on the screen. Um, encourage folks to check that out to know your rights. Um, but also opening it up to the panelists for any thoughts there. Um, you know, I, I think uh, <laughs> one thing I'll just say, I'll get on my soapbox for a minute um, and just say that, you know, this is one of the many ways that COVID-19 has exposed some of the existing and underlying inequities in the state. Um, unfortunately, many workers don't have guaranteed paid sick leave. Um, and I think that's a, a huge hole in our safety net. Um, and it's something that prevents us from being able to adequately respond to this crisis. Um, we know that, uh, you know, that, that folks are getting, you know, not, uh, not feeling confident to be able to take time off work when they're sick um, absolutely was a driver of this virus um, throughout the last year. And um, I think, you know, I think that, that it really underscores the importance of um, solidarity with workers' rights um, and and with folks who um, are are advocating for that because it it really hampers um, our ability to uh, to tackle a public health crisis like this when people don't um, don't know that they can sa safely take time off work when they're sick um, and yeah. So that's my soapbox moment. I'll get off now, but <laughs> let alone time off work to get their vaccine, you know, yeah. or vote. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, this is a complicated time, um, but thank you for your soapbox, Amanda. It's very appreciated. Um, and so, you know, we're coming to the end of the hour. I think if you have any, if the audience has any last minute question, please put it in the chat box now. Um, but, you know, I know we've already talked about the fear that a lot of people feel about getting vaccinated or that their loved ones might feel and their communities just from, you know, historic things that have happened in the past. Uh, and, you know, we, we've seen some comments that people are really scared to get vaccinated. And so we've talked about validating that fear and um, helping people overcome it. I was wondering if we could just circle back around to that for 
you know, any thoughts uh, encouraging people and, um, you know, helping people feel safe to get the vaccine? Well, I think it's it's important to maybe also show the flip side of that is the, the incredible sense of relief and um, security that so many people feel when they do get vaccinated, which is just the opposite of fear. Um, so uh, I think, um, you know, hopefully getting um, the information that we're giving tonight is, is helpful. Um, and and again, also, I appeal to your sense of the public good um, to uh, help our society um, reach herd immunity and and you know and get us out of this nightmare that we've all lived in the last year. Yeah, I, I want to really you know again underscore for folks who maybe weren't with us earlier. Um, you know, these all all three vaccines that are currently available um, are are safe. They've undergone rigorous testing. Um, you know, our our own public health officials have taken these vaccines. Um, you know, Dr. Fauci and um, Dr. Burke Harris here in California, and Dr. Ghali. Um, you know, these these are um, uh, an incredible tool and an important tool in fighting the vaccine. They're safe. They're effective. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I, I know that especially in the beginning, there was a lot of misinformation out there, um, you know, that, that was really stoking some of that fear. Um, and I just want to encourage people to, to hopefully, you know, hopefully you have, uh, you know, been able to learn, learn something about the vaccines, build some confidence in the vaccines. Um, and I, I want people, you know, I, I hope people know that these vaccines are safe and effective. Um, and a really important thing that you can do for your own health and for your community's health. Yeah, you know, I just want to validate and acknowledge people's fear around this, just like Amanda and Dr. Eisenberg mentioned. And, you know, one thing that Dr. Eisenberg had, had mentioned before and uh, around really just um, relating to your client and your patient and, and trying to just empathize with their, their fears. Um, I can think of a specifically an example of a, a Latina woman that I had a conversation with around the vaccine. She was quite informed as well and, and just, you know, kind of kept throwing the questions at me. Well, what if this and what if that? Um, I, and, you know, I in the end, what I just did is I related to her. I, I you know, use myself as an example, which is a healthcare provider. You often you don't don't try and bring and insert yourself into those. But this was one of those circumstances where I felt was really a appropriate. You know, I I said, look, I've I've gotten the vaccine. I feel confident in it. I would not be recommending it to you um, if I did not think it was safe and effective. And if if it wasn't something I was willing to do myself, I wouldn't be putting you on the line for that. And I think that really resonated with her. And so sometimes it really is just that like personal touch, um, just being able to relate to somebody, um, honoring somebody where they're at. We've got one final question from the audience that I think we can squeeze in. Is it true that there were people who received the vaccination and then later tested positive? And what does that mean for folks? So the answer to that is yes, um, and there are several reasons for that. One is the timing. So um, I'm not sure, you know, people are uh, considered to be fully immunized um, about seven to, to 14 days after the second shot for the Pfizer and Moderna and 28 days after um, the J&J. &J. So it's possible that some people were exposed to the virus before then and were not fully immunized. Um, and even uh, for people who were fully immunized, the, uh, the efficacy rates you know, are not 100% for mild disease. So, it's, so you know, it's possible that you could get, still get a mild disease, but the important uh, take home message is it's 100% effective for serious disease. So, um, so that explains why some people can, can still get uh, COVID uh, during the vaccination process and even afterwards. Yeah, it sounds like it's still going to save lives. It's still important to get get whichever one you're offered. Um, any final thoughts from our panelists before I close this out? We're almost there. <laughs> <laughs> like We're Amanda said, there. we all want to party together. So yeah, absolutely. 
Well, you know, we're here at the end of the hour. This has been an incredibly important conversation. I know I have learned things as well. So thank you to our panelists and to our audience members for being so engaged on this tonight. You kept us on our toes. Uh, thank you so much to Sutter Health for sponsoring tonight's event. Uh, it's so, so important. And we've got uh, the Equality California Help Center phone number up on the screen again. It's 323 uh, 448-0126 and the URL if you want some online resources is covid19.eqca.org uh, so thank you again to everyone who joined us tonight uh, looking forward to eligibility being expanded shortly and getting back to, to pride as usual <laughs> um, don't forget to check out myturn.ca.gov as well to find out when it is your turn Thank you so much again, everybody. Have a great evening.